We're wired, we're live, we're back into sorts. Now, I've only got about a seven hour sermon today, so all will be well. <laughs> seven hours, we're going to come play in here. Seven hours, you come play in here, all right. Luke chapter number eight, and uh, uh, it's when I was earlier this week on Monday, I read through this portion of scripture, and Luke chapter eight, verses 19 through 21, and uh, this is the second part of. of Last week I said we cover those verses this week. And I thought, oh, this is so light. It's so simple, you know. There's not a lot here. It's very plain. And uh, how many know that's not the way God's Word is written? Oh, Amen. Uh, there, there's a lot to be involved with the truth of God's Word. And I read it and I'm like, oh. Then I just kept reading in the context of it and just had a great, great Bible study studying this myself. God does such a great work. Um, showing us what He means and showing us what happens in a person's heart. And uh, the context of what we're looking at is the sower and the seed. And the soil is the heart. The soil is the heart. The soil is the heart, right? We, we understand. The seed is the word of truth, the word of God, the gospel, the word of truth. The sower is Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, right? God himself. Uh, the omniscient, all-knowing God, all-powerful God is the sower. Uh, uh, but the heart determines the... Somebody said it, the... Uh, the fruit. The heart determines the fruit, all right? So, uh, yes, I'm so glad you're all in tune right on, right? I know you all know the answers. You're shy. I get it. And uh, so it, we saw the week before where God gives that that analogy, that metaphor, that, that uh, parable, as we call them. And then we saw the truth of some of the parable, but we also saw the next section where God lays upon us the responsibility, okay, of the soil. What is your soil right now? Do you know? When will you find out how your heart is today? And the easy answer is tomorrow. Right? You don't know exactly where you are right now. Who does? God knows where you are, right? Jeremiah 17, 9. Somebody say it. The heart is? Deceitful. Above all else. And? Desperately wicked. And? Who can know? God says, you can't know your own heart. Search me, try me, O oh God. See if there be any wicked way in me. Why would we pray that? Because I don't know. I don't, am I, am I, right now, we have, you know, work day, stuff going on. We were here 12 hours yesterday, Chuck and I, from 9 to 9. Many of you came and were here for 6 or 4 or, or whatever hours. And we worked hard, and then life goes on after that. And am, am I that good ground, but I'm growing so many weeds that nothing comes out of my life for Christ? Oh, or am I that shallow ground? Uh, you know, like when I read my Proverbs, and boy, God shows me it needs to be done, and I do it for three days, and then it dies. I'm shallow ground, right? Or am I that hard ground? God's word was on me last week, and it's just no effect, right? No effect at all. What am I? Or am I good soil? God's truth was illuminated in my heart, and it produced fruit in my life, right? And we found out in James that it was the do. Be not a hearer only, but a doer of the work. And James, same thing. So the fruit equals the doing, right? That's something productive in my life for Jesus Christ. What God shows me, what comes out of my life productive for God, is determined by the soil which God puts into my care. And I find out that I need to work the soil with water, which is the Bible, and fertilizer, which is the bread of life, Jesus Christ, and faith. Uh, I have to work this, I have to till it up with what? Reading my Bible. And it, it tills and breaks up the soil, it fertilizes the soil, it waters the soil, that the soil might be deep and rich and full, and then it can bring forth fruit. I also have to prune some things out of my life, and God may prune some things in my life. It's easier if I do it. And, uh, uh, you know, God might have to take something away from your life. Why? So you can bear more fruit. You find that in John chapter 15. And if I start to do something for God, expect God to come and help you. Right? But how? Get rid of some of the stuff in your life. How many of you are really good at filling your life with useless stuff? How many of you have millions of useless facts? Right? Because you watch the History Channel or you watch some other channel, right? you got all these, you know... Uh, you know something about sea turtles? Well, good for you. <laughs> you know, right? It's interesting stuff, but useless facts. You got lots of them in your brain, right? And sometimes you got to prune out and try to get things narrowed down. 
When God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, what he's trying to do is, is narrow your focus in your life. You can't do everything. You can't be everything. But, but you can be something for God. Narrow your focus. Paul says, this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and pressing towards the, the, the things that are ahead, he says, narrow your focus into the things of God in your life. Narrow your focus. You can't be reading the newspaper and reading a, a, a novel about, you know, some Western, and you, and you can't be watching all these news channels and get all this stuff coming into your brain and then try to open your Bible and get a little bit of God. God says, narrow your focus. Those things, you don't, you don't need those things. There, there's no help. Anybody ever watch the Weather Channel for like 10 hours? And you still don't. You still don't know what it means, right? But I used to watch it to help me sleep, right? And what the thing I noticed was the five-day forecast, every two hours, changes. So why would you have a forecast? Write it down someday. Write down the five-day forecast and write down day five. And see how often it's right. Never. It is never. It, it never. So why would you watch a five-day forecast? Right? It, when you could open up your proverb, and the amount of time you spent looking at the forecast, you could read it. And what does it do? It makes me wise. No, it tills the soil. Amen. Yeah. So all week long, I've read my proverbs and my psalms. I've read some other places in the Bible. Are you holy now? No, but you're ready to hear God's word. Mm -hmm. You've tilled and broken up the soil and added the fertilizer and added that stuff. Then all of a sudden, some of the deeper things of God start to come forth, and you can receive it, and it can bring forth fruit in your life, right? Then all of a sudden, something comes along the next week and strikes your blind side, and you don't panic. But out comes the fruit of the Spirit, trust and faith and God and the peace and the wholeness of the Lord. And what happens? All right? And those are, this is what God does, and it's beautiful. This is what this is about. So this is about your heart, Right? But it's about Jesus. Amen. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ preparing your heart. Let's stand for just a moment. Read uh, Luke chapter 8, verses 19 through 21. And then we'll preach for about 20 minutes. In heaven's time. <laughs> Father, bless the reading of the word. Help us to enjoy it, love it, learn from it. In Jesus' name. Amen. It says, Then came him. I'm sorry, then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come to him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, my, Thy mother and thy brethren are without, desiring to see thee. And he answered and said to them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. James, be not hearer only, but a doer. The fruit, Matthew chapter 13, they that hear the word of God and understand it and bring forth fruit. Who are the brethren of Jesus Christ? The fourth soil. You get it? Right? You got it? Who are the brethren? Now, in context, there's four soils. The hard soil, the shallow soil, the weed-filled soil, and the good soil. The fourth soil, Jesus said, are those that hear and do. That is, those that receive the truth, understand it, and bring forth fruit. They are my brethren. So, if you're one of those people that want to read the fruit and say, which ones are saved? The answer is in the context. They'll know them by their fruits. The answer is in the context. All right. Now, it's not about salvation, so be careful trying to say that out of this, ch this chapter. There's other places I would go to check salvation, but the answer is in the context. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the answer. This, it's interesting what Jesus has to say here, right? When Jesus counts, who's his brother? John chapter number 7, the Bible says that Jesus' brothers had said to him, why go thee not up to the temple? Go, go to the feast. There was a feast at that time. He says, go up to Judea. Go with your disciples and show them your mighty works. If you do all these mighty works, then go up to Jerusalem and show them. For no man doeth these things in secret, if you actually are doing this. And it says, neither did his brethren believe upon him. So who's standing at the door? Unbelievers. 
Who wants to come see him? Those soil that is hard. Who wrote the book of James? Jesus' brother. When did that change? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he goeth and seeth his brother James. Jesus went personally to his brother James after the resurrection. Showed himself personally to James. I think that's when James went, my brother's God. He wrote, and see, this is one of the amazing parts of this Bible to understand what's happening, what Jesus is dividing between right at this moment. And what we see. Jesus is, it's an amazing story. Father, thank you for the truth. Bless it in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, it says, Neither did his brethren believe upon him. Right? And uh, Jesus says in, in chapter, uh, in verses 6 and 7, he says to his brethren, uh, My time is not yet, but your time is always. Oh, by the way, if you have a different Bible translation, check it and let me know if it makes Jesus a liar. The ESV and the NIV and the uh, uh, New American Standard all make Jesus a liar here. And I can prove to you out of your Bible, if you have one of those, that your Jesus Christ is a liar. He says, I go not up to this feast. What's the real Bible say in John chapter 7? Jesus says, I go not up yet. That word yet is taken out of the New Translation. Why? To make Jesus a liar. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. Stick with your old King James. You'll be all right. I don't understand it. It's because God hasn't showed it to you yet. Don't try to understand what you don't understand. Right? Understand what you do understand. Right? <laughs> You'll be alright. But anyway, in that section, that's one of those parts of the Bible I'm like, ah! Luckily, the New King James didn't retain the yet, and so did one other one, Darby's or somebody. He retained the yet. Praise the Lord that he retained the yet there. In John chapter 15, uh, Jesus says this to them. He says, well, John chapter 7, he says to his brothers, my time is not yet, but your time is always. He says, the world cannot hate you. But the world hateth me because I testify of the world. Jesus talks about his person and what he does, his works and how they differentiate between him and his brethren. And his brethren could do anything they want at any time they want. Why? Because they're not directed by God. They're not believers. But Jesus says of himself, he can only do that which God directs him to do. You might see the distinction here between the saved and the unsaved. I can't just take any job I want. I've got to be directed by God. There's limitations to being a Christian. What is it? The will of God. If you're not saved today, you do not have that restriction, right? Joel right now is a bachelor. So he is free from Ephesians chapter 5, right? Verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives. And Joel's like, got that one, right? He's not married. How many of you are married men? What happens, right? The minute Joe says, I do, to my daughter, what happens to him? The weight of Ephesians 5.25 falls from the sky, crushes him like a bug. Right? No. Yes. Amen. Right? But you'll watch it. I'll have it up here to stealing hit. And, uh, <laughs> so he's free from that. And God says in 1 Corinthians, he says, uh, chapter 7, where he talks about, they that are, that are married care for the things of this world, how they may please their wives. And God talks about how that can become a, that, that, that can be a distraction from the work of Christ. Right? But he says, you know, to most 99% of people, God wants you to get married. But he says it does cause a distraction. Uh, what happened? But you see, God's will, I am free from the will of God if I'm not saved. But if you are a Christian, you are not free from God's will in your life. Read John chapter 7 and see what Jesus has to say. Compare it to John chapter 15, verses 18 through 19. He says, the world hates me. He says, the world hateth me. He says, if it hates you, it hated me before it hated you. This world hates the true Jesus Christ. It likes the fake Jesus. You know, the one right here? The, the world likes the hippie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, no, no, that's the baby. The world likes the baby Jesus, too. You know, the first one with, the, with Jesus knocking on the door, you know, he's got this, you know, long, flowing, beautiful hair. <laughs> and uh, they, they, the, the hippie Jesus, you know, no guy, no Jew in that first century would wear hair that long. Unless you were Nazarite, Jesus was not a Nazarite. And that's why they had the long hair, because they confused the idea of he's from Nazareth, that he had took a Nazarite. Wow, he didn't have that. Jesus was not a hippie, right? Who had long, flowing hair and was a hippie? That's Absalom. Who's Absalom? An antichrist. Uh -huh. So who's the Jesus with the long, flowing hair? 
So the world loves that Jesus that doesn't condemn it, that doesn't say anything bad, that just, you know, uh, that, that Jesus who, who never says anything negative, is never in control of them. And uh, they love the Jesus that's not God. But we love the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty. We're subject to the will of God. Jesus says he testifies of the world. John chapter 3, verse 19, God talks about the love and hate relationship. It's all through John. And he says in John chapter 3, verse 18, 19, 19 through 21, he says, uh, um, men love the darkness. There's a love in me. It's a love of darkness, right? And God talks about that love. And they don't love Christ. They love darkness. They hate the light, the Bible says. And this is the, 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 that split with men. We're going somewhere. This is that split with the love and hate relationship. When Jesus starts to talk about this heart issue, the soil issue, the heart, the soil, goes together. Um, I'd love to have you look up all these verses, but, but we have a hard time looking up this many verses in one sermon. I've, I'm hoping you're familiar with many of them. If you're not, I give the text. You can look them up later. Um, John 3, 19 through 21 is what we looked at so far. We looked at John 7, 1 through 5, uh, plus 6 and 7. We looked at John 15, 18 and 19. And uh, now we're going to go to Luke chapter 8, verse 19. Uh, notice what it says in Luke 8, 19. That first word says, then. Then. Let me ask you something. Did Jesus know what was coming? It says, then. So, right after Jesus gets done preaching about the sower and the seed, and then and right after he starts talking about take heed, how you hear, he's sitting at the table. Uh, did he know uh, that his brethren and mother were going to be showing up soon? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think he did? Mm -hmm. he's, God. Yes. he's God. Of course he did. Right? Did he know when they thought about heading over to see him? A day or two earlier. Did he know when he made plans? Does he know what they packed for lunch on the way? Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesus knows who's coming. Did Jesus plan for this and arrange for this? Did he say these words just as he knew his mother and brother were standing outside? Yes, he's God. He, he is in control of everything. Amen. Don't watch Mel Gibson. Don't watch those stupid movies and get your doctrine from them. You want to watch it? I don't care. Watch it. But don't get your doctrine from it. Okay? He chose the place of his cross. He, he was in control the whole time. He didn't Amen. fall because he couldn't carry the beam. He had to fulfill scripture. He gave the beam down. He dropped it. Why? So Sammy would pick it up. Why? Because he had to fulfill two types. He had to bear his own cross. He had to be Isaac. He had to give the cross to another. He had to be the lamb and take the place. He had to do both, and he fulfilled both. Amen. Don't just, 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 just read your Bible and understand. He's God. It wasn't hard for him to carry a piece of wood. Amen. Right? Amen. He could pick up the planet Earth and chuck it out of the universe. That's right. Without any problem. <clears throat> So how hard was it to carry a piece of wood? His human body was 100% in subjection to his deity. Amen. So how far could he push a human body? He's God, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Did he feel it? Oh, yeah. But did it affect him? None at all. The frailties of humanity. Why? Because he's God in the flesh. Never see anything like it. Great is the mystery of God. It's God. It's manifest in the flesh. Never understand. I'll never get it. Neither will you. But he is God. Don't forget that. So he knew what was coming. He knew it. Does he know their hearts? Does he know the heart of his brother standing outside? Mm -hmm. Does he know what they do? They don't believe on him. Why did they come to see him? How do you think mom made him? <laughs> right? They're escorting their mother like the brothers do. They've come to see Jesus. It was younger brothers or older brothers? Younger brothers, how do we know? Because Joseph didn't know Mary until after Christ was born. So they're obviously younger. Amen. We got her. Yeah, that's right. Karen was the first one. She gets the skills for everybody. And uh, <laughs> did he know they were coming? Did he know? Uh, what did he know at this time? Does he know the hearts of those that are standing around and those that are there? Jeremiah 17, 10 it says, I, the Lord, search the hearts. Well, who's saying that? I, the Lord. Who's sitting there? I, the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ searches the hearts. What's he looking for? He's searching your heart right now. What's he looking for? Faith. Right? Faith. What's he looking for? Mm -hmm. Faith? Somebody said faith. Faith in what? Yeah. In Jesus? Right? Who said, he, she said him. If somebody said Jesus, you definitely would get skills. But Jesus, right? He's looking for faith in Jesus. He's looking for faith in Christ. Right? What about Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? Sure do. So does every Catholic. Are you going to heaven? Are they going to heaven? Most likely not. Why? They believe in Jesus. 
What what is he looking for? What's he looking for? What is he searching me for? He's sitting at a table. Whose house is he at? Oh, 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 oh you don't know? No, was it? That was later on. That's a different table. It's a good guess, though. Smart. What? Not Simon the leper. That's later. It's just, that's not not Mary and Martha. Not Simon the leper. Whose house was? That? That's a good guess. I like it. This, you're, you're you're later on in the ministry. This is earlier, right? Somebody he just called to follow him, and and he threw a great big party for all his friends. And uh, okay. Well, we'll let you guys figure that one out. That's a great mystery. That's awesome, right? I'm not going to answer that one. That'd be, that'd be too easy. Um, what? So what about Jesus? Uh, he is God. He is always God. He's never not God. You all got that, right? All right, can we say it together? Ready? He is God. He is always God. He's never not God. We got that, right? So he's God sitting at the table. Wouldn't you like to be there? What would you ask him? So God is sitting at the table. He knows all that's happening. He's never got God. What is he searching the heart for? What is he looking for? One of the things he's looking for is what? What faith? Faith in what? In Jesus. What about Jesus? He is God. He's never not God. He is always God. What is Jesus looking for in your heart today? Jesus Christ Christ is God. He is always God. He is never not God. How do you get saved? Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Confess with your mouth. What's the word Lord mean? God. That's my God and I love him. That's my Jesus. He died for me. And for all the world to hear, I'll say it loud and clear. That's my God. That's my God. Where's uh, the Gospel of John, which proves that Jesus is God? What's the crescendo of the Gospel of John? It's Thomas falling on his face. My Lord and my God. What did he see when he looked in that scar? What did he see? Shekinah glory. What are you going to see when you look inside the scar of Jesus Christ? What do you see under his flesh? <laughs> what did he see in that scar that made him fall on his face and say, My Lord and my God. Peter, lovest thou me? You know I love you. Peter, lovest thou me? You know I love thee. Peter, lovest thou me? You know everything! You got it, son. You are my God. Your omniscient God. It wasn't about what type of love. It's about coming to the point that knowing he's God and confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. The thief on the cross was hanging there and he looked and he said, Lord, remember me. And he looked and said, today me and you, friend, are going to be in paradise together. Right? Which means what? There's two parts to the person. The body goes to the grave, where's the soul go? That's right. It's, it's uh, dualism. Dualism. Jesus said it right there to the thief on the cross. Today, you will be with me together. Amen. In paradise. Oh, that's so awesome. Uh, the Lord searcheth the hearts for faith, faith in Christ. For, what about Christ? Who Christ is? One of the necessary things for salvation is who Christ is. One of the necessary means to live your life in peace and happiness and joys. Who is Jesus Christ? He is God. He is always God. He will forever be God. He's eternally past God. He's eternally future God. He is the I am that I am. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him is life. And the life is the light of men. That's, that's, that's who He is. There was a man sent by God whose name was John. The same that came to bear witness of the light. Yes, God, th to see that Jesus Christ is life. He is, and God is life, and he is. That's what, this is what Jesus is bringing them to. Would it be difficult to see the guys eating dinner next to you as God? You think it's easier now to believe that Jesus Christ was God, or is it easier then, sitting next to him, when he looked at you and said, Pass the salt. 
He looked at him and said, it's too much salt, Lord. It's not good for you. He said, get to behind me, Satan. Pass the salt. Because you know salt is good. The Bible says salt is good. And uh, so he put a little salt on his fish. And he ate it. Would it be hard to believe that was God? It would be, wouldn't it? It would be hard to believe that was it. Jesus said, blessed are they which see not and believe, right? It's expedient that I go away. I think it's a little easier for us than it is for them, right? It would be tough to sit next to God at the dinner table. Yes, it would. John chapter 12, verse 45, Jesus says, he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. You know, if you saw me, you saw God. Now, if I said that, what would you think? Right? Anybody watch that little cartoon Moana? You know, and the guy sings that song about being a demigod. <laughs> I cracked up. My kids would sing that, you know, when you're looking at a demigod, right? <laughs> How many think you're seeing God when you see me? You are. And wouldn't it be sad to get there and see somebody? I mean, what do you expect when you see God, right? The man sitting here says, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Wow. Now, now, obviously, he's talking about the sight of faith. God is spirit. God is not flesh. God is not Jewish. God does not have an a, a ethnical background. He, he doesn't have a national background. God is before nations. God is before the earth. So, so, But if we see Christ, see what? With the eyes of faith. If I see Christ with the eyes of faith, and I see who and what he is, I see God. When I see his character, when I see his means, when I see his compassion, when I see his love, when I see his care for the world, when I see his sacrifice, when I see the cross, I see God. The comprehension of God comes through Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying. It's an amazing statement. Deuteronomy 15, it says, Jesus says, uh, the Bible says, I'll put my words in his mouth and I will require of thee. The prophet that comes will be speaking my words, right? Um, we see what uh, John chapter 12 says, believe Jesus is talking about sight and what they see in him and who he is. You can see who sent him. In John chapter 12, 47 through 49, uh, along with Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18, it talks about the words of Jesus Christ. He that hears his words and believes on him that sent me. Deuteronomy 18, God says, I'll put my words in his mouth and I'll require of those that hear him. This is the prophet. This is Jesus Christ. He says, See, hear my words. Believe in my person. Hear my words. And John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 6, verse 35. John chapter 6, verse 47. John chapter 7, verse 38. John eleven twenty five. 25. John 12, 44. All Jesus says, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I want to define this. I want to get an understanding. It's believing in the personhood of who Jesus Christ is. Remember, we're back at the dinner table. And he's talking about your soil. He's talking about your heart. And the tilling of the heart and the seed. Who Jesus is. The person who believeth on me of eternal life. But then he says in John 14, 12, Believe upon the work that I do. All of a sudden, what happens? Be a hearer of the word, not a doer only. Believe upon my words and believe upon my works. Believe on what I do. What's Jesus saying? What's the doing? It's the fruit. What's the heart? It's the soil. The soil's the heart. The doing is the fruit. The truth is from God. The sower and the seed, who is it about? If you think it's about you, you've made a mistake in your Bible again. Who's the Bible about? Whose soil are you trying to look for? His. What was the soil of Jesus Christ? Which one was he? Now you're starting to understand. Now you're starting to get it. Look at what he does. Look at his fruit. Listen to his words. Watch what he says. Watch who he is. Find it. What do you find? All the other soils are what? All who came before me are thieves and robbers. The prophecy of Gamaliel. 
If it be of God, none can stand against it. If it be of men, it will not last. Who said you'll know them by their fruits? Check out Christianity. No, check out Christ. You start to see the fruit, the soil is Jesus Christ himself. He's the seed. He's the sower. Why wouldn't he be the soil? Of course he is. If I can believe in the soil, who he was. Wow. What happens to my soil when I believe in his soil? This is, what, this is where it starts to come. It's about who he is and believing in who he is and what he's done proves who he is and what he says. i got to believe in who he is, what he said, and what he did. And they all come together proving the soil. That's who he is. The soil is who he is. And this is what I start to bring forth in my life. What's that do to my soil? Believe the words, the works, and the word. John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 36. John chapter 5, verse 47. The words, the works, and the word. You get those, those, those verses in your mind and get them cycling through, cycling through your mind. And all of a sudden, the words, the works of, of Jesus Christ, believe his words, believe his works, believe is the word of God. The soil is the heart, the fruits, the dew, the seed is the word of God as it comes forth. Matthew chapter 13, it tells us in the soil of the seed, the little phrase when we compare Luke and Matthew, we find a phrase in Matthew that's a little different. It says, he that hears the word and understands it is the good soil. It's the perfect understanding as, the, as it brings forth. The heart reorders the priorities of your life. The order of relationships equals the fruit. Jesus is more important than my family. Who are my brethren? Who are my? Who is my mother? They that hear the word of God and do it. What happens in the soil is when the soil receives the seed as in truth, the good ground, it automatically reorders the priority in my life. And my priorities shift. Ryrie puts a note in his Bible, very simple. He says, uh, under where Jesus says, my mother and my brethren, those who belong to God's spiritual family are closer to Christ than those related to him by natural birth. What it's talking about is that what is Jesus putting forth there? In the soil and the seed, his family shows up. He says, who are? He's working on the soil and he's revealing his own. And this is where it gets, and I know some of you look at me like I'm from outer space. Okay, it's okay. Relationship to Christ trumps all. That's what happened when I got saved, and it, the soil brought forth fruit, is re priorities changed in my life, and relationship to God trumps all. Why don't I drink beer? Because God said to avoid it. No, because relationship to God trumps all. Why would I quit smoking? Because relationship to God trumps all. Why don't I swear? Because relationship to God trumps all. The number one rule of reform is unanimous. If God's against it, so am I. Boy, that'll help your life, won't it? If God's against it, so am I. Why don't I chew? I did before. Anybody else ever tried it? Did you turn green too? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't swallow that stuff. I, I found that out. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's a habit I can't do it. But why not? Because God's against it, so am I. God's against so much stuff in the world, so so am I. Right? And that's, that orders your life a lot. Why? Because God trumps all. God trumps mom and dad. God trumps brothers and sisters. God, my focus to God. What's that? That's a sign of soil. Jesus Christ says, I love you, but I love him first. Let's look at Jesus' soil. The world hates me because I testify of it. It can't hate you. The world hateth on its own. Wow. Is that, see, this is when we start to see what Jesus is putting in the context of sower and the seed, 
right? It's a, and of course, Christ is the seed. Christ is the sower. Christ is also the soil. I'm looking at Christ because I have to believe in who he is. What happens when I see what he is, the full dynamic of Christ comes upon me? It changes my soil. And this is what happens. Now, in order to finish this in a timely manner, um, let me read this to you. The relationship to Christ trumps all. Uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 19 through 20 says, Hear the word and do. Notice what he says in verse number uh, 21, the red letters, if you've got a red letter Bible. It says, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do. That is, that is good soil bringing forth fruit. That's what hear and do is. Matthew adds understanding. Jesus knows that. They hear the word. They understand the word. The word has the effect it's supposed to have, and they bring forth fruit. That is the good soil is with the fruit. Now, Luke chapter 8, and uh, verse, 20, verse number uh, 22 through number 25 is where I'd love to spend the rest of the day. And yes, I will. But it'll be quick. Ready? Now, remember what, what's happening. They have to, in their heart, understand his heart. They have to understand who he is by the soil that he is and the fruit that he's producing and the fruit that's out of his life. He says, if you believe not me, believe me for the work's sake. And he says, believe the words that I have said. I am the resurrection of life. He that believes in me, uh, sh uh, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He says, believe upon him. You have everlasting life. Hear him. Understand the words. See what he's doing. Try me, Jesus says. What am I? You're God. When you come to that conclusion, your soil starts to till. Why? Because he's God. So I'm focusing on who he is. So what's he do? He says, now, some of you that believe on me, you're, you're not going to be able to handle what's coming in your life. you got some things coming in your life that are pretty rough. Right, so uh, how many know his disciples were all martyred? Right? They all gave their life for Christ. Why? Because they weren't afraid to die. How could you not fear death? Right? You all wear your seatbelts, right? Most of you? Why? <laughs> right? Uh, we don't want to die. We fear death. We don't fear being dead, but, but we fear death. Right? And uh, we have this fear in us and, and this natural thing to stay alive is what we want. We want to stay alive. And then there's this fear. How did these men come to the point that they all gave their lives for Christ freely? Uh, uh, Matthias was filleted to death. And, and Andrew died over there, heading over into China and trying to spread the word of God over there. John was put into boiling. You ever get boiled? You ever burned yourself? Uh, that's bad. Uh, how did they face these things without fear? How did God remove completely the fear of death? He says, okay, you disciples, you're going to face something um, that you're going to need some great faith for. So here, follow me. Let's get in this boat. Hey, guys, let's go to the other side of the lake. All right. So what's he say? Verse number 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day. Interesting, because Mark tells us it was the same day. That he went to a ship with his disciples, and he saith to them, let us go over to the other side of the ship. Uh, I think it's Matthew tells us he got in the boat. He walked over, got in the boat, and said, come on, guys, let's go to the other side of the ship. So we compare these, we compare the text, and we compare one to the other, and get the full statement of what's being said here. He says, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And uh, we, we understand there's a faith in the word of God is what he said. Uh, do you think Jesus knew what, what, what was coming? Do you know what's about to happen? The disciples' faith is not yet true nor full. It's to the extent that will be necessary to face what's coming in their life. So what does he do? Are they saved? Certainly. Of course they're saved. But God says from faith to faith. How do I grow my faith? And God says, here, you guys have to come to the point of full realization of who I am. In order for this to happen, we're going to enter a ship. So they got into the ship and they, they launched forth, it says. Notice the obedience. He said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Their lack of faith was that they'd, they'd make it to the other side. What's the lake? What's the other side? Where are they crossing? I'm asking you about types and symbols. What's the other side? Let us go over to the other side of the lake. They get obedience, it says, and they launched forth. The disciples get in the boat, just like Jesus said. Who made the initiative? Jesus did. Jesus takes the initiative to say, come on. He gets in the boat, says, come on, let's go to the other side. They get into the boat, right? But as they sailed, he fell asleep. Gee, I wonder. Huh. 
God's sleeping. I love this story about who's in your boat. Who's in your boat? Is God in your boat? What happens when God's in your boat? You don't have to worry about sinking. Right? God's in the boat. Could that boat have sunk? I mean, could it have sunk? God's in the boat. Right? What would happen if it did sink? Well, he walked across the water later. Right? Do you think he has trouble with buoyancy? Does he understand the elements? We know that when, when God looked at Peter and said, come here, Peter walked on the water. He said, we're going to the other side. What happens if the boat sinks? What would you say? Well, let's go to the other side. Mark tells us that there were other little boats also with them. Now, this is kind of cool. So I wrote in my Bible, I'm a little boat. I wasn't there. I wasn't in the big boat. I'm not a big fish. I'm not like the disciples there. But I'm one of the little boats going next to them. Guess what? I get to go to the storm too. But guess what else the little boats experienced? So what happens? Jesus falls asleep in the boat. Everybody else in the little boats don't know Jesus is sleeping. Only the disciples know Jesus is sleeping, right? But you know, when Jesus falls asleep, does, is he aware of what's going on? He's God. He's always God. He's never not God. God is omniscient, knowing all things. Does Jesus know all things at this moment? Yeah. Is he omnipresent at this moment? Yes. He says, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven, John chapter 3. Jesus says, Nicodemus, right now, I'm in heaven. Hmm. He's God. He's always God. He's never not God. He can't put off omniscience and omnipotence. He cannot stop being God. That, 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 that can't happen. Otherwise, if he's not God, there is no trinity. If God is not a trinity, God is not God. He can't stop being God. You can't break the trinity. Or else God ceases to exist. Can God cease to exist? He can't. He's always God. He's never not God. He is God. All right? Uh, look at Psalm 107 real quick. We're just going to read this passage. We're almost done. I promise you we are really close. And uh, it won't be like Wednesday night. I loved Wednesday night. About six hours of study. We packed it into an hour and a half. And uh, I love eschatology. How many know where I'm going in Psalm 107? How many would say, I, I have a cross right where I know where I'm going? Look at Psalm 107, verse 24. Why did Jesus say, come in the boat? Come on, guys. Get in the boat. We're going to go to the other side. Why? Look at Psalm 107, verse 24. I'm sorry, 23. Psalm 107, verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. God says, you know there's something about these seafaring guys. People that go out on the ocean, talk to some Navy personnel. They see the wonders and work of God, right? When that, that great big aircraft carrier gets thrown around like it's a toy, right? These people that go into the deep see the work of the Lord. Why did Jesus say, hey guys, let's get in a boat? What do they need to see? Look at verse 25. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind. Who does? God does. Is Jesus asleep? No. What's he doing? He's raising up a storm. Who raises the storm? Jesus does. Who's in the boat? Jesus. Who's in control of the storm? Jesus. He's God. He's always God. He's never not God. The Lord raises up the storm. God says, come get the boat. Why? I got a surprise for you. Right? He commandeth the, and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Now, now you're starting to get seasick, aren't you? You're picturing it in your mind. Right? Their soul is melted because of trouble. Who's they? Who's this talking about? It's talking about the disciples, isn't it? They reel to and fro. You ever been on a ship in the, out in the, in the Erie? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, see sailor's legs. Right? If you don't have sailor's legs, you fall over. It was so cute on our honeymoon, watching my wife when she was in that ship. And she was walking down, and she'd be like, <laughs> she hit the wall. It was so, it's, oh, it was so cute. It, it was so cute. And uh, she laughed at me, too. They reel to and fro in, in the waves. Right? Their soul gets melted, it says. And what happens in the big storm? It says, they stagger like drunken men, and they're at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. How many of you do that? <laughs> Help me, God. Yes. 
and he bringeth them out of their transgression. What's he do? He maketh the storm a calm, and the waves thereof still. Then they are glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them to the desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Who raised the storm? Jesus did. Who's sleeping in the boat? Jesus is. Who's in control of everything? Jesus is. So we read the story. We're back in Luke chapter 8, verse number 23. They, uh, as they sailed, he fell asleep. And they came down to the stormy, the sto came down a storm of wind on the lake. Who made the storm? Jesus did. He rises up the wind, which makes the waves rise up. And, and they were filled with water. The boat's filling with water. How fast were they bailing? Quick, 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 right? Working their way, working their way to get across the lake. Working their way to get across the lake. Bailing out. And they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. How much jeopardy were they in? What were they in jeopardy of? Sinking, obviously, but what were they in jeopardy of? Losing their life. Can you lose your life? He that seeketh his life, or he that keepeth his life, shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake and the gospel's shall gain it. Are they in danger of losing life? Is there any danger for a Christian to ever losing his life? Never. Your life, if you're saved, is hid in Christ, in God, with Christ, in God. And Christ, who is our life, when he shall appear, my life, what is life? Where are we at now? The lie of Satan. Make the stone bread. Remember that? Remember that? What, why did Jesus answer, men doth not live? The source of life. Satan, you're a liar. Life, defined by God, means in harmony with him. Well, death, defined by God, means separated from him. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Though you walked around and everybody thought you were alive, God knew you were dead. What is life? What is death? What are they in jeopardy of? Are they really in jeopardy? Is there any jeopardy of a Christian losing his life? That's called security of salvation. Do you know you're saved? Do you know you're always saved and will always be saved? Or are you still thinking you might lose it someday? What do they got to deal with here? What's wrong with their soil? Who saved me? God did. Who did? The omniscient God. Did he know what I was going to do next week? Did he still save me? So then how can I get unsaved if he knew what I was going to do the rest of my life? If he knew I was going to deny him one day, but he saved me today and then lost me then? Did you start to see the problem? Why would he save you today if he knew you were going to, you were going to deny him 20 years from now? Because he's not God. Security of salvation is based on the omniscience of God. It's based on who he is. Who's in your boat? You don't understand. He's sleeping. You don't understand. He made the storm. Why? Because he's good. He's taking you somewhere. Ah, what is he taking these guys? All right, we'll speed along here. But as they sailed, he fell asleep in the storm in the lake. And it was full of water. They were in jeopardy. Of what? Of what? Of what were they in jeopardy? Of? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Come on. Think, think, think. Use your mind. Deductive and inductive reasoning. God has given you a brain for something, and it's a good brain. Why? It can think. And they came to him. Good idea. And they woke him saying, Master, Master, we perish. Now the Bible tells us uh, over in uh, Mark that added to this, Master, carest thou not that we perish? That's the devil's lie. Number, or number three on the list of God's devil's lies is what? God is not doing anything about sin. Why do little girls get raped? Why does God allow these things to happen? Why does God let that accident Why does God let these things happen? Why doesn't God end sin today? Well, how would you be if he did? What are you accusing God of? He's evil. And Satan says there's three reasons why God doesn't end sin. One, either he doesn't know how. He can't figure out the solution to sin. That's his number one lie. When you sin, God, he's omni-love. He's ultimate love. And he's also ultimate judgment. There's nothing he can do when you sin because those two things can't meet. Either he doesn't know what to do, or he doesn't have the power to do it, 
or he just doesn't care. And that's why that little girl got raped for nine years by her stepdad. Because God doesn't care. And that's what Satan says. That's his lie. And we sit and say, well, why doesn't God intervene? God, do something! And Steve says, welcome to Habakkuk chapter 1. Why does Paul quote Habakkuk in, in Romans chapter 1 as an answer? And why did God answer with the just shall live by faith when Habakkuk says, why don't you do something about evil? And we realize we fall right into the Satan's lie. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Jesus, how can you be sleeping? Don't you, don't you see what's going on? We're walking like dogs. We're about to die. My love for tea. And the devil's lies racing through our mind and heart. And they come right to Christ. What do they need? What do they got to know? What makes soil? And do I trust in the soil of Christ? Well, you're starting to you see, you're getting, this, this is deep. It is. But, but it's awesome. It's awesome. Psalm 107, verse 23 through 31 gives us the key, the answer, right? It tells us that Psalm, especially watch Psalm, uh, I love that, uh, Psalm 107, verse 24. Trust in his word. Let's go over to the other side. He is God. Now we compare these things. Let's finish the story. We're done. And they came and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Master, Master, we perish. And he arose. And he rebuked the wind. What did he say? He tells us Mark. I think it's Mark. Matthew doesn't tell us. Uh, I think. They just say, they, but he rebuked the wind. How, how would you like a rebuke from God? Right? It's a rebuke. He rebuked the wind. Right? What did he say to him? Get out of here. Yo, you stop. You better be good. Uh, what, what did he say to the wind? What did he rebuke the wind and the waves with? Right? Waves, I'm tired of you scaring my friends. What did he say? What kind of a God do we have? What did he say? Peace. What did he say? Be still and know I am the I am. I am God. Which means what? Omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, omnibenevolent. I am all good. In me is light, and there's no darkness at all. Do you believe this? Every facet of life, I am God, and I am good. Or are you going to come and say, do you care? Can you help? Why don't you come? Why are you letting me see this? What, God? You should do something. Now, you don't pray like that, do you? Welcome to Habakkuk, chapter 1. If Steve ever finishes it, he's going to teach our whole series, right, Steve? Because God quotes Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, to answer to, the, to Habakkuk, and it settles his whole life. With all the three lies of Satan is running through his mind. And then Paul reads that and goes, you know what the key? You know what the key to the entire New Testament? Let me quote it in Galatians. Let me quote it in Hebrews. Let me quote it in, in Romans. Let me, the three key books to the New Testament, tie the whole New Testament together with the Old Testament. Let me show you the entire thing. The just shall live by faith. And that's the answer. Faith in what? Soil. Whose soil? His soil. Oh, this is, it's the person. Why? What happens? Okay, look at verse number 25. We close it. It's so awesome. What is it? Oh, it's subjective or object of faith. It's subject. Well, is it subject to faith? Is that what he's going to ask me? My subject of faith is to ride within me. We don't deny sub subjective faith, faith that I create. Why? Because that's what saves me. My faith in Jesus Christ that derives out of me, whosoever will, that's me, put my faith in Christ. I believe in him. That is subject to faith created by me. That saves my soul. Without it, you don't go to heaven. Jesus can die for you. And he may have, but you don't go to heaven. Why? Because your faith isn't there. So without your faith, you can't go to heaven, even though he died for your sins. He died for the sins of the whole world. We say it this way. He died for all, but it's not upon all. It's only upon those that believe. 
but he died for all. You might recognize that, Romans chapter 3. He died for all, and it's upon all that believe. So he died for everyone, but only the people that put their faith, subjective faith, are the ones who are saved. Or is he talking about objective faith? We know that subjective faith can't save. Why? Because if there's no object, he says, if Christ be not risen, your faith is vain. It doesn't matter how much you believe it if Jesus isn't risen from the dead. It doesn't matter how much you believe in Muhammad. It doesn't matter. Why? He can't save you. No matter how much you believe in Mary, can't save you. No matter how much faith I have, it's meaningless if it's not objectively true what I believe in. I believe my altimeter 100%. What if it's broke? You're still going to hit the mountain. Your faith makes no difference. So what is Jesus saying here? Look what he says in verse 25. The winds cease and everything calmed and the raging stopped. And what do he say? And he said to them, where is your faith? Now, all right, Chuck, put up on the screen, Mark chapter 4, and uh, verse, uh, I think it's 41. Let me check. If you can get there first, Mark chapter 4, and uh, let me just read it. Let me read it. Oh, this is awesome. Mark chapter 4. Um, it's Mark where he says, peace, be still. Peace. It's verse 40. Mark chapter 4, verse 40. Go ahead, put it up there, Mark 4, 40. There it is. And he said to them, why are ye so fearful? So Jesus begins this question, this statement with a question. How is it, two questions, why are you so fearful and how is it you have no faith? Subjective faith or objective faith? What is it? What is it? Faith in, in a, the, the object of Christ or subjective faith, my faith in him? Which one is he talking about? How is it you have no faith? Now, let's go to Matthew chapter number 8, uh, Chuck. Matthew chapter 8. And I think it's verse uh, 24, but let me tell you, Matthew chapter 8, uh, 26. Matthew 8, 26. There it is, Matthew 8, 26. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful, O ye of little faith? So now we put these together. What does Jesus come up with? Right? What is the full sentence of what Jesus said? Why are ye so faithful? Where is your faith? And, what's he, and then he says, How is it you have no faith? O ye of little faith. And then what's he say in, in, in Luke chapter 8? I lost my place there. I, uh, somehow I got to Luke 23. We'll be there eventually. 2036. Um, he says, uh, where is your faith? How is it you have no faith? Why are you so fearful? Where is your faith? Ye of little faith, where is it? Boy, those questions all together, he asks three different questions and makes one statement. You have little faith. Where is your faith? Where is it located today? That's going to determine your soil. Where is your faith located? Where is it? You've got little faith. Where is it located? Why are you so fearful? Why does life trouble you so much? It's an indication of your faith. Uh, what's happening to your mind and the panic that hits your son? It's, it's an indication of your faith. Your reaction to the coronavirus is an indication of your faith. Anybody caught it yet? Because of, there's so much hype about the coronavirus when you catch it. I, I was reading an article today, they're saying, uh, or yesterday, they were saying that there's many, many of the symptoms, up to 50% of the symptoms that they're finding with the coronavirus can be asymptomatic, or not asymptomatic, they can be psychosomatic. People panic when they catch it. Oh my goodness, I've got the coronavirus! Well, yeah, it's bad. It was nasty, awful thing. It's killed a lot of people, but where's your faith? Something comes along in your life, and all of a sudden something happens. Where is your faith? What is it in? Where is it located? What is the object? Where is the subject? Subjective, little, objective, where? We know that mustard seed faith saves the soul. But what does a mustard seed faith do for walking? Romans, saved by faith. Hebrews, walking by faith. A little bit of faith ain't going to cut it when it comes to walking through this world. It can get you saved. But it's not going to cut it when it comes to walking this life. Come get my boat. Why? 
I got a storm I'm rising up. Why? Because you got to learn something. Look at verse 25. Luke chapter 8, verse 25. And he saith to them, where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered. You know, they were, very, they were afraid before. Mark says the, that they were afraid of the storm. Then he says, but when they saw what Jesus said, they were very afraid. Right? What happened? The subject of their fear was on the water, the waves, the filling boat. And then Jesus gets up, speaks the word. What's his rebuke? Be still, be calm. Peace, be still. That's quite a, well, don't you love the way the Lord rebukes you? Hey, yes, God? Peace. <laughs> is that a rebuke from God? What? Our God is so gentle. Peace, be still. And all of it stills. And then what they do? It said, then their fear transferred from the external world to a man. And their fear was transferred to him. Where is your faith? And it says, and they looked at him, and it says, uh, Mark says, they were greatly afraid. It might be Matthew. They were greatly afraid and wonder, saying, now the questions are so important in your Bible. What matter of man is he? What matter of man is this? And the sea obey him. What a question. Get it, Peter. Get it, Mark. Get it. What matter of man is this? What kind of soil are we looking at? What is it? What manner of man? You answer the question. What manner of man is it? Hypostatic union. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He's the Ark of the Covenant, which means what? Gold inside, gold outside. All you see is deity. But in the inside, there's wood, which is humanity. And he's attached to humanity. And God took upon himself perfect humanity, never seen before. And now he's standing in a boat and he says, Whew. and a storm 45,000 feet high and an ocean, which is unbelievable, not an ocean, but a sea with an incredible amount of power. You know how powerful water is? goes, Whew. and he turns around. I'm going to go finish my nap. <laughs> what manner of man is he? What's this story about? Sower and the seed. What manner of man is he? Isn't that awesome? The Bible's incredible. Where's your faith today? I hope it's not in, you know, I believe in Jesus. I hope it's who Jesus is. Right? He reached down to you. Who did? God did. Right? My faith is in the fact he can't break his word. He's omniscient God. He knows all things. He's omnipotent. He can do anything. And the day when I was 14 and said, Jesus, I accept. He reached from heaven and saved me. And he's God. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. What's that? Who he is, what he did. Thou shalt be saved. That's how you started. That's salvation. Now what? What manner of man is this? And that's, it's, it's about the sower and the seed, friends. It's unbelievable whose fruit and whose soil and what we're looking. You keep reading the sower and the seed, you keep thinking about yourself. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. Turn yourself off of self. Turn it to Christ. Examine him. And what happens? The soil starts to churn. The tractor's digging deep. The fertilizer and water's being applied. When? When I'm looking at Christ. I'm reading my Proverbs. Wisdom crieth out. Who's that? Jesus. Who's the wicked one? The Antichrist. Who's the wise one? Who's the strong one? Who, who, who's the good man? Who's the righteous man? Oh, I got to be a good boy. Oh, I got to... No. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Every verse is about him. Or his counterpart, the Antichrist. The wicked, the righteous. The wicked, the righteous. Jesus, Antichrist. Jesus, Antichrist. Jesus, Satan. Jesus, Satan. Man, he filled the entire book of Proverbs. He's so wise. He's so brilliant. He's so strong. He's so righteous. He's so pure. What's happening to my heart? Now you start to understand how the Bible is written, and every one of them is about Christ. 
So stop reading the source seed and say, where's my soil? Am I good or bad? Yeah, it's real. But how do I till up my soil, God? Turn your eyes upon Christ and look for him in every passage. And your soil becomes deep and rich. And that gets you through life. That brings forth the fruit of the Spirit. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the truth of God's word. I hope it's comprehensive, Lord. I, just, I know it's not comprehensive, but comprehending might rest upon our hearts to help us, God, to help me seek Christ in all that I do and all that I am. And Lord, as you reorder my life and priorities, they're all messed up sometimes. Father, would you help us get it right? Lord, is somebody not saved sitting right here? I pray that you reach into that heart that they might put their trust in Jesus Christ, who he is, what he is, what he's done. Lord, is somebody here walking through a dark valley, a Christian struggling, may they hear the words of Jesus Christ, peace be still. Somebody here doubting God, doubting his goodness, the lies of Satan penetrating their heart. Lord, I pray for that precious soul. That as they hear these lies spoken, they might deny them and say, that is from hell. That is not from God. I know who my God is. Lord, so I pray for that soul. Are they watching on the camera, God? Are they struggling? Is it a year from now as they watch on YouTube? I don't know who they are, what they are. But I know the God of heaven that will save. So, Lord, I pray for them. Bless this service. Bless this time as we leave and we depart from this. Give us safety as we go and travel and do what we do. But we know safety is of the Lord. Let our hearts hear the words of Christ. Peace be still. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing a song of invitation. I hope service is a blessing to you today. And uh, I picked out a song. I have no idea what it is. It's down here on the floor. And uh, I picked out page song 157. We're just going to sing a verse of it. And uh, as we let us stand and sing, page 157, I heard the Savior say, if you're not saved today, I'd like you just to come up and just, just say, I'm not saved. If you're watching and you're not saved, I'd like you to, to, to call me or text me, 814-331-6452. Uh, Get a hold of me and say, I'm not saved. I'd like some information on it. I'd like to talk about it. I'd like to hear about it. I'll do what I can to help you. You can come right up right here. If you're walking in a valley, then close your songbook and just start praying. And, 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 and just put your faith and turn, your, turn it towards Christ. Turn it towards Christ. Uh, pick up your Bible this afternoon. And find a story that you've always read and read it in a different light looking for Christ. Just a short one, 10 verses or something, and read it looking for Christ. And, and start the practice of, of, of a different order in your Bible. Don't tell me what to do, God. Show me what Jesus did. And I'm going to use this book to examine Christ so my faith will grow. Because he's altogether beautiful. You'll never find a fault. No matter what direction, no matter what Bible passage you apply to Christ, he fulfilled it all. And your faith grows, not by getting beaten down by your Bible. Oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. It's he did it all. And watch his kindness and his benevolence and his giving and his willingness and his compassion. and his. It's all about him. And if we, I tell you, folks, this is the secret to being a happy, joyful, fruitful Christian. All right? Let's sing it. Uh, page 157. I heard the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Let's sing it together. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me your all in all. Jesus paid it all to him I owe.